Thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join our press conferences. Today, I'm happy to announce that in January of 2016, we will open a new company in the US, Toyota Research Institute. Initially, the focus of the institute will be research and development of artificial intelligence. Dr. Gil Pratt, who joined Toyota in September, will serve as the CEO of the new entity. He is well known as a program manager for the DARPA Robotics Challenges. When I met Gil in August, my first question to him was quite simple. Why are you joining Toyota? He said, I want to contribute to making society better. Gil told me that AI can reduce traffic accidents, but it cannot completely eliminate them without human input. And it is essential that people and machines collaborate to create a truly safe and secure mobile societies. This collaboration is important also outside the mobility field. AI has significant potential to further improve all of society. This response from one of the best known AI researchers was exactly the same as Toyota's founding principle. As technology continues to progress, we'll be able to further improve our product. But at Toyota, we don't pursue innovation simply because we can. We pursue it because we should. It will be possible to create a new industry by combining AI and big data. Beyond mobility, with these technologies, we want to contribute to make life better for our customers and society as a whole. We use innovative technologies like AI to make a society ever better, safer, more pleasant, and promising today, tomorrow, and the next 100 years. I want to work with Gil not just because he is an amazing researcher and engineer, but because I believe his goals and motivations are the same as ours. When he showed me this picture of him doing brake job on a Corolla 35 years ago, I really, really wanted to work with him. Nice hair, Jill. But seriously, I believe Gail will be a great asset for us. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce the man who will help us achieve our goals. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Gail Pratt. Konnichiwa. Several months ago, I began talking to Toyota executives about their desire to accelerate innovation in artificial intelligence. At first, I thought they simply wanted to be more competitive with other automakers and companies and to become more active in the field. But with every meeting that I had, my eyes got bigger. I heard the incredible scope of their goals. The higher up in the company I went, the bolder the goals became. I realized the importance of what Toyota wanted to accomplish. The purpose of the Toyota Research Institute, TRI, is to bridge the gap between fundamental research and product development, particularly of life-saving and life-improving technologies. TRI will focus first 
on collaborative autonomy and artificial intelligence, the way that people and machines can work together, particularly in the area of mobility. We have three initial goals for TRI. Safety, accessibility, and robotics. The safety goal is to make driving much safer by preventing cars from being involved in accidents, regardless of a driver's actions. In accessibility, our goal is to enable every person to benefit from the mobility of cars, regardless of the demographics of the person or their physical challenges. And finally, our robotics goal is to improve the quality of life for all people, in particular to allow seniors the dignity of aging in place in their own familiar homes, regardless of age or infirmity. So I'd like to talk a little bit about myself, since I'm new to most of you here in Japan, and where my motivations come from. My father immigrated to the United States in the 1950s. His first job was working on an assembly line for the Ford Motor Company in Edison, New Jersey, putting tires on cars. He spent his evenings after work earning degrees first in chemical engineering and then environmental engineering, with a specialty in air pollution. So I learned about engineering, I learned about how cars worked, and I learned about how air pollution controls worked from my father. But of course, like most kids, I watched TV when I came home, and it was one of my first exposures to Japan. Uh, there was a TV show called Gigantor in the United States that was my favorite. It was actually a dubbed version of an early Japanese anime that you may know, Tetsujin Niju Ha Chigo. You know the robot, Tetsujin. A giant robot controlled by a little boy. I really wanted to build that robot someday. I was very fortunate. I went to a high school very close to Bell Laboratories in New Jersey. And they had special programs there for students who wanted to spend one evening each week under the mentorship of some of the world's top scientists. I ended up working at Bell Labs during my summers in college, both in the physics department and in the computer science divisions. At Bell Labs, I learned how really smart people think and how really great management created the crown jewel of research laboratories in the United States. I went to MIT after that. I was there for 21 years. I started as an undergraduate. I ended up as a junior professor in electrical engineering and computer science. After MIT, I helped to found another school called Olin College, which was uh, an innovative school. When I was a professor at MIT, I started working on walking robots and I did that under funding from DARPA. As you might imagine, there was an influence from Japan at that time as well, because my walking robots had a little bit of a resemblance to Tetsujin Niju Hachigo. But unfortunately, my robots did not have jet engines on the back, and they could not fly like Tetsujin. In 2010, I decided that it was my turn to give back because I had been the recipient of funding from DARPA. So I went to work as DARPA as a program manager, and it happened after my first year there on March 11th, 2011, again, an interaction with Japan because of the earthquake and the tsunami. I spent the next week at DARPA working very, very hard on the phone with different robotics companies that DARPA had funded before to develop robots. These were robots that had the possibility of helping at Fukushima. I worked to evaluate their resistance to radiation. There were three of them, the Packbot, the Talon, and the Thunderhawk. And all three of them eventually were sent to Fukushima. But unfortunately, it was too late. The robots were not effective in time to prevent the explosions. And it was because of that difficulty, that failure, to have the robots respond in time at Fukushima that I started the DARPA Robotics Challenge. This was a program that was a $100 million effort funded by the US government 
to develop robots that could work as partners to human beings and lessen the extent of a disaster. Because of my experience at MIT, where I had gotten to know colleagues in the robotics field at Japan, I knew how strong robotics was in Japan. And so I decided to work together with others to form a collaboration agreement between the governments of the US and Japan in disaster robotics. We were very successful in that work, and we in fact did form an agreement, and a Japanese team won the first place in the second phase of our contest. They were far superior to the other teams. And the Japanese, uh, in fact, fielded five teams in the final phase of the DARPA Robotics Challenge. This became a very milestone, very important um, part of the robotics field. So that's a little bit about my academic background and my scientific work. What I'd like to do now is talk to you about a more personal thing and exactly why I took this job at Toyota. Uh, I had three very difficult events happen in my life, and they relate to all of this work I will talk to you about. First, when I was in grade school, I actually had the misfortune of coming across and seeing a fatal accident. There was a young boy who was riding his bicycle, and very sadly, an accident occurred where he was struck by an automobile and he was killed. I saw this, uh, I remember it like it was yesterday in my mind, the picture of the, the poor boy, and also looking at the driver sitting across the street on a park bed with his uh, head in his hands, crying because of what had happened. I came home stunned. It was a moment that I would never forget, and it would have a lasting impression on me. The second event I want to relate actually again has to do with my father, who at the age of 83 had reached the age where he could no longer safely drive. And my sister and I had to go to our father, who had always been the one to decide when it was safe for us to do something, and tell him that we had to take away his car keys because it was no longer safe for him to drive. This was an incredibly disappointing day for him and a very hard time for us. The final event I want to describe is when my father was 84. And he had to move from his home, which he had loved and which was familiar to him, to a nursing home. As I'm sure many of you have dealt with the same thing, given our aging society, this is a very common problem. TRI's three goals in safety, accessibility, and robotics ring very true to me because of these three difficult events in my life. And this is at the core of why I took the job here with Toyota. I would like to make the world be a place where these kinds of events are far less likely to occur for families everywhere around the world. Of course, we're just beginning now, and I can't possibly accomplish this alone. I want to make even better cars, and I want to do so with many others as a member of the Toyota team. I want to improve the quality of life for all people through mobility technology. I want to close today uh, with a calculation, because after all, I'm an engineer. Toyota sells approximately 10 million vehicles per year. That means that in 10 years, we produce around 100 million vehicles. If each one of those vehicles travels 10,000 kilometers a year, which is approximately the average. It means that Toyota vehicles around the world travel one trillion kilometers every year. A trillion kilometers. It's 10 to the 12th for those of you that are scientists or engineers. This is an extraordinarily large number. And as these vehicles travel, they generate tremendous amounts of information. Information about the vehicle, information about the environment, and information about the driver. I think that we can actually use that information for tremendous social good. And I think that this information will be a key for us to accelerate the evolution of future technology. The cumulative kilometers driven and the geographies that they show also tell us that it will be very difficult for us to create cars 
and other mobility systems that are sufficiently reliable. A trillion kilometers is a very long distance. And we must ensure that our systems are safe for all of those kilometers. And that's why we have the large scale of the effort that we're announcing today. I believe that AI using this kind of technology can bring tremendous quality of life to society. And I want to add just a little bit more because, again, I began thinking maybe Toyota is only interested in cars. Maybe Toyota might be pushed a little bit to be interested in robotics too. And what I learned, the higher up I spoke, as I mentioned before, was that Toyota's ambitions are far greater. Toyota wants to actually apply AI much more broadly to help society. I'll give some examples. AI can be used to schedule cars, to manage traffic, to deliver goods, to schedule the operation of a factory, even beyond Toyota's famous production system. It can also be used, and here's an amazing thing, to accelerate the scientific discovery of materials and environmental technology. Knowledge is power. The gathering of a lot of data and the understanding of that data can be tremendously effective and a force for social good. So TRI will aim to develop technology for these and I'm sure other applications to expand Toyota's boundaries, to positively impact society. And I think Toyota will contribute to society by transforming from a successful hardware company to a new company that integrates software technologies as well as builds the world's best hardware. And that's why I joined Toyota. Finally, let me close. Last week at the Toyota Motor Show, excuse me, the Tokyo Motor Show, where Toyota cars were present, Toyota-san spoke about stepping up to the plate and meeting challenges head on, taking full responsibility without making excuses no matter what happens. That sort of courage is incredible. And now I realize it's my time to step up to the plate, and I believe that taking on these challenges gives us the power to change the world, and I can't wait to begin. So thank you very much. Arigato gozaimashita. それではこの後質疑応答を行いますので準備が。We would like to open the floor for questions and please wait for a few moments before the stage is prepared for that. Thank you. Now, at this juncture, we would like to have a questions and answers session for about 30 minutes. Uh, no media scrum is scheduled, and therefore, if you have any questions, please ask those questions here at this Q&A session. Once again, let me introduce the members present here today. Dr. Gil Pratt, Executive Technical Advisor, Toyota Motor Corporation. Akio Toyoda, President of Toyota Motor Corporation. If you have questions, please Raise your hand so that the microphone can be brought to you, and please state your name and the affiliation. And uh, may I limit uh, the questions to two questions per person to give uh, opportunities for asking questions to as many journalists as possible. Person in the front row, please. Okudaira of a Japan Economic Journal. I have two questions. Question number one, which is addressed to Dr. Pratt. Uh, you have decided to work together with Toyota. 
in this area, you are the most renowned expert in Silicon Valley. The big companies, Google and others, I understand, also made overtures to you trying to approach you. Why did you choose Toyota as your partner? Secondly, um, second question is can be answered either of you. Uh, you said you're going to uh, gather or employ 200 people in this new company, but I think the there is a strenuous of competition going on to hire best people. And the students, engineers in this uh, field, Toyota probably is not the top most um, desired employer. How do you intend to hire and collect capable people? Well, uh, I will try to answer the first question first. Uh, why did I choose Toyota? Uh, First of all, uh, some of it comes from my love of Japan. Uh, I came to Japan uh, many years ago when I was a professor at MIT uh, to a robotics conference in Yokohama. Uh, the heart is a very mysterious organ. I am not sure what I love so much about Japan, but I feel very good here and I feel at home. And so part of my reason was uh, that I really uh, enjoy being in Japan. Uh, the second is that I believe that Japan has a uh, situation which much of the world will face. In the United States, the aging society crisis is as follows. We have 13% of our population over age 65 now. In 15 years, we will have 20% over age 65. From what I have read in Japan, it is presently 25% and may someday soon go to 40%. Because the problem is more difficult here, I believe that companies in Japan understand this problem very significantly and very well. And so I think that to address these problems as well as other problems in society, of course, Japan is a wonderful society where there is tremendous bonding between people, the idea that we are all responsible for each other and social good. Uh, I thought that working with Toyota was actually the best choice. Uh, so those are some of the reasons that I chose Toyota. Uh, your second question was, why 200? Would you like me to answer? Okay. Uh, 200 is our idea of how large uh, the uh, number of people should be for our initial effort. It will take several years for us uh, to hire uh, that number of people. We understand this. But we think that what we are doing is rather important and rather different than some other companies, even in Silicon Valley, because we are so focused on social good. Uh, we make hardware also, and that hardware is used by people around the world for their mobility, which gives a tremendous sense of autonomy and also fun. At the same time, of course, safety is a huge uh, problem and a huge commitment by our company for our cars to be safe. And we will work incredibly hard to make cars safer in the future. Thank you. Allow me to respond to that by sharing with you some of my expectations of Dr. Pratt or Gil. Uh, his love of a Tetsu Niju Hajigo or um, Gigander is one of the important reasons, but putting the jokes aside, the DARPA's robotic challenge was a, such a successful proposition under his leadership, and he does have the leading edge expertise and also human uh, network, uh, which cannot be substituted by anybody else. So that is so valuable. And at the same time, his personal experience at his young age, that is to say, encountering traffic accident that resulted in the death of a young boy, left a very vivid impression on him. And with such a person, by taking advantage of AI technology and technology in other areas, we would like to realize the products that can really offer safety and peace of mind in driving to people. So with respect to automated driving as well as usage of AI technology, uh, what I have just mentioned and what uh, Dr. Pratt shares is exactly the same as our finding, uh, founding uh, philosophy, and that's what I expect of him.
Kikuchi from Chubu Economic Newspaper. I have one question to President Toyota. So the announcement of this new company or institute, so I'd like to ask you for the future perspective, the automotive, aut automatic driving and the advanced um, technology, you will be focusing on the advanced technology in the mobility area and so you want more people to live safely and so what kind of contribution can this new TRI make in this new society? Well, the AI technology for the future, uh, it will change drastically the future society and people's lifestyles. And of course, we are mostly producing cars, but I think AIs will become the fundamental to support various industries. So it will create new industries, including areas in the cars. So AI and big data will be an elemental technology. It will be a very important technology. So I'd like the past knowledge and the human network that Gil has to apply it. What kind of chemistry will he be able to generate? We are really excited about this. And the automated, automatic driving. Well, this is something that we will be tackling in the near future. But Toyota Research Institute, we expect that institute to go beyond the cars and mobility and to make people's lives richer and to contribute to the society. So that's what, what I mean by standing on the plate. Miyamoto of Chunichi Newspaper. My question is addressed to Mr. Toyoda. Some time ago, at the time of the Tokyo Motor Show, you made presentations and made announcements. And more recently, Toyota seems to have somewhat changed uh, with respect to automated driving. So including that aspect, as for the future, what form of automated driving is Toyota aiming to attain? Could you share that with us? And in that context, how do you intend to make use of AI technology? That's one of the questions. In addition to that, more recently, it was reported that in Nagoya, uh, during the experiment of um, automated driving, there was the self-inflicted accident. And how do you intend to secure safety uh, as you try to achieve uh, automated driving? I will answer the first part of the question, and I'd like to ask Gail to supplement my answer. With respect to automated driving, I personally used to say in the past that in 24-hour race, the, if the automated uh, vehicle beats our human-driven vehicles, I'll embrace automated dri uh, driving. And that was some time ago. I used to think that some time ago. But I do realize that my view has changed somewhat, uh, which was triggered by our decision to support the Olympic Games. Together with the Olympic Games, the Paralympic Games are also uh, going to be held. In the past, uh, with respect to athletes participating in Paralympic Games, I thought that so-called well cab, the vehicles especially developed for the handicapped, would be the most welcome vehicles. That was a self-centered view, but getting involved with Olympic Games, I came to realize, and uh, I was told by those uh, athletes in Paralympics, that they also want to drive cool cars, stylish cars, not just cars for the handi uh, handicapped people. And that made me realize that in order to convey fun to drive to a broader spectrum of the people, the usage of uh, automated driving uh, could go beyond what I used to consider about the potential of automated driving. And from that perspective, I now want to uh, promote and accelerate the development of automated driving. And at that point in time, I encountered Dr. Pratt. He also mentioned the Toyota's responsibility of safety with respect to one trillion miles driven by our customers. This is the assets that we build together with customers. And from the viewpoint of building and offering safe mobility, we'll be able to use such data and distance driven. The unmanned vehicles or automated uh, vehicles, in either case, uh, what I would like 
to feel very strongly about is 100 years ago, horses were replaced by automobiles because people found automobiles to be more fun than horses. So in 100 years from now, I would like vehicles to remain loved by people because cars here in Japan are affectionately referred to as beloved cars. So even 100 from, uh, years from now, I would like to have as many people as possible enjoy driving and enjoy fun to drive, and that I think is the responsibility of a Toyota, offering that together with safety. Uh, thank you, Akio. Uh, I will add a little bit, and I will be, I'm sorry, a little technical in my answer. Uh, in general, with adding AI to a car, there are two different aspects, one of which is a what we call a series autonomy, and the other one is which called parallel autonomy. In series autonomy, the driver tells the computer what the computer should do, and then the computer in series between the driver and the car goes ahead and controls the car to do it. A simple example of series autonomy is cruise control. You tell the car, I want to go so fast, and the cruise control circuit keeps the car going at the right speed, and you no longer worry about the speed. The opposite of series autonomy is parallel autonomy. Here, you drive the car the way you wish, and the autonomy is watching what you're doing and watching the environment around the car. And if the autonomy detects trouble, it acts in parallel with you to change your command to the car directly. Anti-lock braking is a simple example of parallel autonomy, where the anti-lock brake control changes how strongly you are applying the brakes to each wheel to try to resolve a skid condition. Now, each of these different aspects, parallel and series, can be extended to much more sophisticated technology with AI. For example, with series autonomy, you can tell the car, I am very tired, I cannot drive, take me home. And you can close your eyes and the car will take you home. It turns out that that is a very difficult goal to achieve because the car must be able to safely drive under all conditions without fail because you may be asleep. In parallel autonomy, the car can try to help us to approach the goal of having a car never responsible for an accident. For instance, if you are driving and by accident a car next to you begins to encroach and to cut you off in your lane, the parallel autonomy can decide to veer you out of the way so you do not have an accident even if you do not move the wheel. It is like a driver's education teacher sitting next to you pushing on the wheel in parallel with you. So I hope you understand these two different opposite dual ways of doing autonomy. Parallel autonomy is very important and Toyota is working very hard to have more and more parallel systems to help rescue a driver from having an accident even if the driver makes a mistake. Series autonomy is also important as Akio-san said, if you have a driver with poor eyesight who cannot see very well, is handicapped, if you have a senior citizen whose reflexes are not so good, it is important that occasionally the series autonomy be able to drive the car for them and allow them the freedom of mobility. So at Toyota, we are planning in the future to work on both of these aspects and to make progress on both, and to allow both to happen. I want to end with one part, which was actually part of my first conversation with Akio-san. And this was about how parallel autonomy can actually make cars more fun to drive. If you are a non-expert driver, but you would like to experience the joy of driving in a way at high performance, what is wonderful about parallel autonomy is that it can help prevent you from having an accident even if your skill is not quite good enough and it can help you learn how to drive better because it will help teach you 
how to drive in the best way. So I think that we do not have to give up fun to drive with autonomy. In fact, one can help the other. Thank you. いかがでしょうか Any other question?、Um, please, person at all the way at the left. I、um, have two questions. My first question is for Mr. Toyota.、Um, why now? Why is it that you're announcing this now? You know, how has the changing landscape of the automobile sector impacted your thinking and decision today? Um, and my second question is for Dr. Pratt.、Um, how will the new institute compete with the likes of Google or major companies that already have a very big budget,、um, annual RD budget of perhaps around $10 billion?、Um, or are there room for collaborations with these players?、Um, what, what's your stance on、um, the role that these companies play and the relationship between your new institute and these players? Thank you. Why now? Well, since I assumed this、uh, president post,、uh, well, I have gone through various trials and、uh, challenges, and I wasn't able to look forward. There was no room for me to really look to the future, but I think it's important that everybody makes the efforts towards the same direction. And now is we, have this,、uh, we are ready to stand at the plate. So is it too early or is it too late? That's something to be judged in the future. And I hope that you will keep on looking at us so that you can make that judgment. Toyota Group and、uh, Toyota Motors, well, we have gone through. The model change of our group companies. So that's a real unique point about our company. We started from Loop, Loom and then we changed to manufacturing cars. So we have, ver we have changed the products that the group companies manufactured. So we have that history. So we can. Apply this AI and robotics to industries other than the motor industries. And big data and AI can be used as an element technology in other industries. Let me try to answer the second question.、Uh, how will we compete with the likes of Google and Apple and other companies that are working in this field?、Uh, I know that、uh, Toyota san here loves to race cars. And so I will use the metaphor of a car race. It is possible at the beginning of a car race that you may not be in the best position. It may be that other drivers are、uh, saying a whole lot about what their position is, and everyone may expect that a particular car will win. But of course, if the race is very long, who knows who will win? And we are going to work extremely hard. The problem of adding safety and accessibility to cars, and also to go beyond in robotics and other fields, is extremely difficult. And the truth is, we are only at the beginning of this race. I want to help the press and the public to understand when they see a car that does not have a human being behind the wheel, and it seems to be driving, that the car is not as intelligent as a human being. Behind the wheel, even though it seems it might be, because the car has several technological advantages presently. Inside of that car is a map that shows where all of the roads are. When a human being drives, we can drive very safely without a map. The car also has a very accurate GPS system. A human being can drive a car safely without a GPS system. The car has routes that are very precisely given that show exactly the place on the road it should drive. We can drive on a road and can、uh, figure out for ourselves from our eyes where on the lane we should go. And so, when you see a lot of demonstrations of autonomous vehicles, it is very easy to be fooled into thinking the car is more intelligent than it is when really the car is using all of this. Sort of superhuman information to accomplish its goal 
looking like it has that intelligence of a person, but it really doesn't. To achieve safe driving, not in most conditions, but all conditions, we must actually develop AI that has the competence of human beings, even if the map doesn't work because we're going somewhere where the road has changed, even if the GPS signal is poor because there are trees that are blocking the GPS system, and even if the special sensors the car has uh, are not operating correctly. We must ensure the car is safe all of the time. And so that requires much more work, much more research and development to truly have the AI be as competent as a human driver. So questions like this assume that we are near the end of the race. The truth is we're only at the beginning. Thank you. We will only take two more questions. Ogawa of New Miuri newspaper. Thank you for this opportunity. I would like to ask both uh, President Toyoda and uh, Dr. Pratt. Oftentimes it is explained that. Uh, driverless driving is different from automated driving. And in your presentation, you talked about uh, the development of AI technology uh, with human interface or human involvement. And avoiding accident is the same thing. But how is uh, driverless driving is different from automated driving? Could you share your views separately? And also, Dr. Pratt, currently the research and development is going on throughout the world. And you right now said that it's very difficult to achieve the truly safe driving. But when do you think that this completely safe driving technology becomes a reality? And I may be digressing a little bit in terms of uh, safe uh, mobility. And this question is addressed to Mr. Toyoda. But uh, Takata's inflator has uh, come up as a very serious issue. Um, and uh, in yesterday's press conference, uh, SMO, Mr. Hayakawa said that Toyota is going to adopt a better uh, airbag. But at the same time, the US authority uh, prohibited the usage of certain inflators. And Takata agreed not to do that. And the true cause has not been identified. And whether this uh, airbag is uh, safe or not need to be uh, investigated further. But because of the accidents caused by Takata's airbag, uh, consumers must have been apprehensive about that. What is your view on that? Uh, let me just uh, answer the first part of the question. And I'd like to ask Gail to supplement me. And uh, first, let me respond to this Takata issue, first of all. What is most important above anything else is the safety and peace of mind of customers and give the top priority, highest priority to that customer's safety. And for that purpose, we need to come to the bottom of this problem and ident identify the true cause of this, continue to have the thorough investigation as much as possible. Uh, since the very beginning, uh, we have continued to say that, and this applies to Takata Isi as well. Uh, in the case of a response that Toyota is taking, we're going to take here the uh, inflator using ammonium nitrate produced by Takata uh, will not be adopted by Toyota. But even if the inflator is manufactured uh, by Toyota, uh, if it does not use ammonium nitrate, and so long as the quality and the safety is assured, uh, we would like to uh, examine that case by case. Earlier, you asked about the difference between driverless driving and automated driving. And I'll share my thoughts, first of all, and would like to invite Gil's uh, opinion there as well. In my case, either way, the objective ultimately must be to reduce traffic accident casualties down to zero and also streamline the um, flow of traffic. And these objectives remain unchanged, and we will not drift away from those. But at the same time, the emotional aspect offered by vehicles is also important, moving from point A to point B. In the case of vehicles, it offers freedom as well as emotional content to that. By moving from uh, different places, various stories are created. And if anything that undermines that cannot be called a car, cannot be referred to as vehicles. And therefore, be it uh, driverless driving or automated driving, 
It should not just be means of mobility, it should also offer freedom of mobility as well as emotional element, that is to say something that can be a partner of the driver or human beings. So be it driverless uh, vehicle or automated driving, those are the points I would like to insist on. Thank you. Um, let me fill that in just a little more. Um, and I will start actually with an emotional story, which is when I first met you, uh, the word you used the most, I don't know if you remember, in our conversation was love, I. And uh, the love of a person with a car. And uh, this is absolutely true. Uh, I talked a lot about my father in my speech. Uh, my father told me how much he loved to drive cars, and he told me about driving at night, and that he felt, uh, when there was no traffic, that the car was an extension of his body, that he and the car were merged into one and that the headlights, as they pierced through the darkness, uh, were cutting through and giving him vision that he otherwise would not have. Uh, there is an incredible thing about cars that amplifies us in our own autonomy, in our own freedom, that, you know, fun is a wonderful world, word, but it's very, very deep. And it's the same joy that a child feels when it goes from crawling to learning to walk and to run. And a car amplifies that and allows us to go long distances and quickly and feel the incredible control. So uh, to say that we have to give this up and to turn cars into trains that happen to run on roads, I think is a very sad thing. And I do not want to give it up. I think we can have both. Uh, to get to the specific point, um, the technology for all of this AI to assist one way or the other is actually very similar. We must have AI for perception to allow the car to see the same way that we see and to understand the objects in the world that the sensors pick up. Is that a truck in front of me? Is that a car to the side? Is there someone trying to cross the road as a pedestrian? Is there a bicyclist? Has the weather changed? Maybe there is ice now. That perception is very important and AI can work tremendously to help the machine have much more perception than now. Because until recently, cars have been blind, and now we are beginning to see that cars are able to see, and that's the new revolution. In addition, we have AI technology for cars to be able to plan, to use their perception, and to decide what is best to do. And that perception and planning technology can be used universally in both automated driving, in what is sometimes called driverless driving, and also in robotics. It's really the same technology. The difference is how often does the autonomy take control from the driver? In the parallel system I described before, the autonomy only takes control if the driver is about to have an accident. And the autonomy says, don't do that, you need to do something a little different. And it tries to stay out of the way as much as possible. Think of anti-lock brakes. They only intervene when you're skidding, typically on ice. And the rest of the time, they stay out of the way to not interfere with your uh, braking. Uh, the other alternative is to allow the autonomy to operate a greater percentage of the time. For instance, I'm very tired, or maybe uh, I have reached the age where my eyes are not so good, or maybe I am blind and I still want to be able to have a car to get me from one place to the other. In this case, the autonomy, again with the same technology, must take over the driving a greater percentage of the time. And there are many settings in between. And so it isn't really a question of two different options. It's a question of a blend between two different modes based on the same technology. It is generally true that the more percentage the autonomy works, the higher the quality and reliability must be. So I expect that we will see many intermediate forms along the way before we get to a car where a driver is free to choose how they wish to have the car work for them. Ultimately, it's about the freedom of human beings. And I think that all of us would love to have a car that can be used anyway. It can be used when we are tired to get home, it can be used when we want the car to park itself in the parking lot, and we don't want to spend time doing that. Uh, or when we're having a really fun time on a Sunday drive, and we just entered a curve that was just a little bit too fast for us, and we made a mistake, 
I want the car to save me and to have me not spin out and have an accident. I think we can have all of that. I hope that answers the question. We'll take the last question, please. News. I have a uh, question for Mr. Toyota. Uh, Mr. Pratt shared with us many uh, personal stories about uh, sort of what drives this effort for him. Do you yourself have any personal stories, uh, whether it's uh, family members who have aged or your children getting their licenses and, and concerns about their safety? Any, any personal uh, stories that uh, sort of drive this effort for, for you and, and your interests in pushing this technology along. Thank you. Hi, Anna. Yes, well, I, when I was a child, I didn't really uh, encounter a fatal accident. I haven't seen such an accident, but um, I myself, oh, I'm a president, but I was a test driver, and I do drive cars. And when I was a test driver, I did take some dangerous behaviors. That sometimes the car was beyond or uh, be beyond the limit of safety, and I sometimes experienced the cars not parking in the right place or cars in a dangerous situation. I was not an engineer, but I used those experiences to talk with engineers about cars. So when I launch. Uh, products at Toyota. I'm the final person responsible, so I am really the last person to say whether it's a safe product or not. So I always sit on the wheel as um, and looking at the safety. So Dr. Pratt experienced those um, sad things when in his childhood, but uh, those tragedy of car accidents. Um, I try to understand the tragedy of accidents, and I always want to be able to understand about it. So as long as I can feel those, I really want to promote AI and uh, big data for the mobility and for the f society. And this is not limited to cars. We have a lot of potential capabilities at Toyota Group, so we'd like to utilize AI and big data, what kind of future can we create with those technologies? I think I have, we have taken a half step towards the future, and I hope that uh, you will focus on our efforts. Thank you. Thank you so much. This concludes our session. We will have a photo session, so if you'd like to take photos, please be prepared. パワーポイントを変えてください。さっきも高くしたやつ。オッケー。はい、え、それではフォトセッションの明かりにしていただいて明るくしていただけますか。で、恐れ入ります。え、トヨタ社長ギルハカセ、え、握手などしていただけますか
ムービーの皆様もよろしいでしょうかはい、えー、それではレフトサイドプリーズはい、それではそろそろお時間もございますので、えー、皆様、取材ありがとうございました。えー、豊田社長、ギル博士ありがとうございました。